right, hello and welcome to another expert inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am delighted to be joined by Dr. Tanvi Gossam, who is in one of my favorite places in the world, and that's Singapore. How are you doing, Tanvi? Oh, fantastic. So nice to be here, John. Yeah, and I'm as usual in, in San Diego, not, not a too shabby part of the world either, um, but uh, it's great. So uh, morning for, for Tan, the evening for me, so we'll see whose energy levels are, are, are best as we go through this. But we, what we wanted to talk about today is, you know, uh, Tan v is an award-winning keynote speaker, coach and consultant and works with lots of, uh, of companies, large and small, really helping them with their go-to-market. And one of the things that you say, Tan v, is you say this, uh, no story, no sales. What does that actually mean? Well, it's very simple for anyone who is in sales, who's wondering whether should they tell a story or not. And I tell them, no, absolutely. You don't have to tell a story unless you want the sale. So if you want <laughs> the sale, you better, you better pay attention. Because, you know, the thing is that I find um, oftentimes when salespeople um, are in the market, they are so fascinated by all the facts and figures that they're trying to push onto the client uh, that they don't recognize that it's very important to create that connection. I always tell people connection before conversion, right. uh, before you can convert them to your idea, you need to connect with them. And I think that's mm -hmm. where stories become very, very important. You know, like they say, facts tell, but stories sell. So that's why I say no story, no sales. And it's interesting. So people who are listening to this might say, well, okay, I, I hear what you're saying, but is there any, is there any evidence to back up this, any, any research or scientific evidence to back up that stories really do help sell? Uh, yes, absolutely. I'll give, you, I'll give you two examples. One, which probably has happened to almost everyone on this call. So it's a personal story. Uh, and then I'll give you some scientific ones so that, you know, whichever part appeals to you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we all have had those days when, you know, be, you know, we have been like, okay, we're going to eat healthy, lose weight, you know, get into shape and all of that. And then you have a bad day at office, you haven't done enough sales, your boss is on your case, your girlfriend's left you, whatever is the case, right? And you're sitting late night on the couch and then you're like, you know what, I really need to have that chocolate ice cream. And you mm -hmm. go to the fridge and you get the, you know, the ice cream out and on the wrapper it says 55 grams sugar. Mm -hmm. um, and you look at it and what do you say? Oh, 55 grams sugar, this is really bad for my body. This is not something I should put in. Um, I'm going to leave this and go get myself some green juice. No, you yeah. look at the 55 grams of fat or sugar, whatever it is, you toss the wrapper, you eat the ice cream because you just so need it at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So what am I trying to say? You know, facts don't make people take action. Mm -hmm. It is emotions. You had to attend to your emotions first, which is why you didn't give a damn about what that rapper said, right? <laughs> so it's, if you want people to take action, connect to their emotions. It's a myth. One of the biggest myths going around is that human beings are rational. In case no one has sent you the email, we are not <laughs> rational beings. We are, <laughs> we are emotional beings. Talk mm -hmm. to the emotions first. Yeah. But <clears throat> coming more seriously, right? Um, they have done tests where they have seen like if you're telling a, a, a story and I'm listening to a story and they hook up our, you know, brain activity. Right. And what they find is that um, when two people are engaged in telling and listening to a story, there is something known as um, the mirror neurons that get fired, which means the parts of your brain that light up and the parts of my brain that light up are identical. And can you imagine how, Amazing is that in mm -hmm. an attention deficit world where something yes, is sir. constantly hissing, beeping, ringing, pinging for our attention. <laughs> for, me, for me to have you in that spot where we are exactly aligned in that moment. Right. And so uh, scientists, scientists have actually given a name. Your audience can Google it up. It's mm -hmm. called uh, neurocoupling. When your neurons right. get coupled in a way that they are, they are identical. And, and also that you know, a good story uh, raises a level of oxytocin in the body, which is a bonding hormone. And then you right. think about it. Let's do a simple test right now. If I, I just want you to tune into your body and I just want, you know, if I took, came to you and I said, listen, once upon a time, <laughs> right? And how do you feel when you hear those words, right? You're automatically yeah, yeah. like, 
yes, tell me, what about yeah. once upon a time? Exactly, like, it's, very, it's very relaxing. It's funny because what you're saying here, I guess, is if you think about it, most cultures in the world have a an oral tradition of some kind right and mm. storytelling is like for for instance like i'm originally from ireland right uh, storytelling is is culturally a you know very part of the fabric of the of the country and in times gone by like storytellers were like the rock stars of today right uh and so i think it it kind of stands to reason because there is an, an oral tradition in most cultures that storytelling would have would have a very powerful impact on people. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, I saw there was this meme doing the rounds the other day, right? The cavemen that were doing on the walls, and someone said that was of course Facebook, where we were putting our updates on the walls, uh, telling our story on what happened today and what animal did I catch or what have you. But you're right. I mean, stories are at the heart of every ancient civilization. I mean. Um, all the whether it's china india of course definitely ireland mm -hmm. uh, and all these stories have been passed from generation to generation with the help of no powerpoint deck thank you very much <laughs> uh, because stories are sticky and they tend to to get around and they're such an amazing vehicle to convey our ideas so it is no surprise that as we are looking at humanizing our organizations that we are going back to tools that actually made us human. Yeah. The sharing of stories, the coming together to hear the stories. And that's why, you know, while storytelling in sales is nothing new, I think we are seeing a massive resurgence because our clients are looking for that human connection. They don't want to be told or sold to. They want to, you know, you, uh, to connect with real people. Yeah. And I think also, if you think about it in, in, in sales, you know, particularly in B2B, uh, there's a lot riding on the buyer's shoulders, right? I mean, when they're making a decision to purchase something on behalf of their company, there's a, there, there's a lot of stress and pressure on them to make the right decision, spend the money wisely. So by engaging with them in this way and you know, telling stories, success stories, but telling them in a good way uh, can have a comforting effect on them. But let me ask you this. Uh, the storytelling is this is this across all the b's is this a b to c or a b to b uh, can you use it does it work better in one than the in, than the other is it applicable to both i really wish you had not asked me that question because i i get on a soapbox and people ask this question it's a very common question by the way so mm. um so i you know the first thing you're quite right in the b2b process especially in enterprise sales right where mm -hmm. the process is so long there's so many stakeholders involved you are not going to move from one stage to the other just on the basis of you know the facts that you're trying to push mm -hmm. down it's not going to happen for a fact but i can tell you this um it's not just the b2b although most people tend to think that b2c is where the game is at in storytelling I definitely think B2C is, it's, it's an easier connect on where you would use stories. Mm -hmm. But I find it works beautifully in B2B as well. And the reason for that is that storytelling at the end of the day is H to H. So it's human to human. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're talking to a human being, it doesn't matter whether you're doing a B2B or a B2C. You know, sometimes we use frameworks that have been created for a different context and we try and push them pull uh, into other uh, right. you know, scenarios. I'm not sure whether, uh, you know, the concept of storytelling is confined by the B2B or B2C framework. All that you have to be mindful of that in a B2B cycle, because there are a larger number of stakeholders, the type of stories that you might end up telling and the variation that you might need to bring in may be a little bit more nuanced than if you were doing a B2C where you were maybe going with one particular concise consumer persona that you are speaking to. Mm -hmm. The landscape is much more varied in a B2B. But does sure. storytelling work? Absolutely. It works in both the contexts. So here's a so here's another interesting uh, question. I think is that okay. So story, we've established storytelling is, is a good thing. How do you know the right stories to tell? How do you know how long your stories should be? Because let's face it, uh, we want when we engage with a buyer, we want the buyer to do a lot of talking. We want to ask good questions and all of that. How do you how do you ensure that as a salesperson you don't start 
telling rambling stories or stories that really at the end of the day have no point to them. So, um, so what kind of stories should you be, should you be using? Right. That's such a great question. Right. Um, and I always tell people um, that a great place to start is even before you go into the conversation, just step back and try and understand the context that you're entering. Right. I think new storytellers make this mistake of, OK, here are my three signature stories and I'm going to go and I'm going to tell them. And I always say, listen, don't show up and throw up as they say, right? I've got a story and I'm going to tell it whether you know, it sure. connects or not because it's a story. Mm -hmm. No. Um, I think the question to ask is, um, where in the sales process is the customer, right? Um, and we all know this. Your audience is savvy enough to know this, mm -hmm. that you know, they've done their research on you. They've looked, looked you up online. They've probably heard some stories about you already. So they have something in their head, which is already some sort of a narrative, even before you walk through the door. Mm -hmm. There's hardly ever a possibility that you'll walk in without a story in their head. So I, I try and, uh, you know, help people see that that's a great place to begin. What's the story in their head? And if you can get a handle on what's the story in their head, you know how to align uh, your conversation with it much better, right? So, you know, a typical example might be, you might be selling the latest and the best thing that happens in sliced bread. And the only story in their head is that these guys are just too expensive, right? right? right. So you can keep telling that story, but their reptilian brain is focused on, be done with it and tell me how much is this going to cost me, right? Mm -hmm. And so I often ask people that once they have realized where the customer is at in their journey with you and uncover the narrative that's in their head and think about what is going to be the counter story that will very quickly help them move past that narrative into the direction that you want them to go. And this needs a little bit of work. So, you know, oftentimes I'll give my clients some um, you know, templates that allow that point of reflection to happen. You will have to do a little bit of digging around. You may have to talk to previous account managers who handled that account. Mm. But if for any reason you're not able to uncover that, engage in story listening before you engage in storytelling. Right. Try, try and elicit what the customer's story might be and listen without prejudice, as they say, um, as to... What are the nuances that are really coming through? And now you're listening for two stories, actually, when you're doing this. Mm -hmm. One is the narrative in their head around what it is that you're trying to sell them. Right. But a second more important one, which is why I really like the, the last post that you did on LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. I read that, mm -hmm. uh, which was on what's the story in their head about you? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. It's your personal brand. Mm -hmm. uh, that's there in the room when you have walked in. Now, these two stories exist simultaneously and you need to make sure that both the stories are loaded in your favor. Right. Um, and so when trying to decide, that's my, my, my place to begin. Uncover the narrative, whether it's by research or it's by engaging in story listening and be mindful of the story in their head about you as an individual going back to what we were saying. It's a human to human activity at the end of the day. Right. And therefore, so your story in that case may be uh, some stories about how other customers in the past uh, maybe had had you know, concerns or, or budget restrictions or whatever, and then they overcame them and they made save this money or whatever. And the ways of of helping them helping them see that there are, that there is um, that other people have been in the same boat as they have been in, and this is not and and we understand this. Yeah, I, I so th what you're talking about is the very typical, most common story that are, that salespeople end up using, which is a before and after story. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, there you were, you were like 500 pounds overweight, and then you came and worked with us. And, and I'm just using weight because I'm trying to lose some, so I hope you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> my, you can see what's on my mind right now. It's not uh -huh. enterprise sales or IT. But anyway, it, you know, it just connects. But here's just something else that I just illustrated for you, mm -hmm. right? Don't make the mistake of thinking that the stories that you will tell will only be stories exactly about the product that you're sure. selling. Sometimes the stories that allow us to connect with each other very, very deeply. It could simply be about the fact that you and I are both very interested in ma running marathons. 
mm-hmm. right? Or it could just be about, you know, we are both, um, you know, listening to similar kinds of, of podcasts. You, mm-hmm. you really want to be engaging the person in front of you and creating that connection before. And, and I had, you know, I have been in situations where we had a 40 minute meeting of which 35 minutes were spent discussing Game of Thrones. And the last five minutes were like, yeah, yeah, you know what? We actually heard good things about your product. Maybe you know, just send us a contract. We'll have a look over, get back to you. People don't realize that, you know, the connection that we create with stories far supersedes the connections we will create with any PowerPoint right. deck or brochures or descriptions. Because when we don't use stories, this is my favorite, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, framing that I like to give people which is why I say no story, no sales. When you're working without a story, be that on a one-on-one interpersonal level or be that, you know, at the level of, you know, the product to product that you're trying to, to engage the customer with. Without a story, you are engaging half the brain and right. no heart. Mm. Now, how is a person listening to you if they're listening to you with half a brain and no heart? <laughs> and I'm saying you want to engage the whole brain and their heart Mm. and then see the difference in the way they engage with you so yes before and after stories are good but come on they are expecting you to tell them before and after stories okay here's my every single leader that has been in a session with me Mm -hmm. i i tattoo this on their arm okay i physically tattoo this no i'm just i just tattoo it in their brain right (laughs) which is the which is this you have to interrupt the pattern. Right. Uh, let me just repeat that for effect. You have, <laughs> <laughs> you have to interrupt the pattern. If they are expecting you to come in and tell a before and after story, do everything except tell right. a before and after story because that's what every single competitor is doing right so you almost need to have this ability to so for me for example when i'm working with and i work a lot with the c-suite direct which Mm -hmm. because i need to understand the vision of the company and you know the narrative they want to take to market before i can work with the account managers right and more often than not they're so excited that they want to work with me on storytelling and invariably my opening line to them is Let's see if this is a good idea or not. And if this is not a good idea, I'll find someone to work with you who might be able to help you. I don't know if right. I'm the answer. And, and I'm telling you, John, I don't do this for effect. I mm-hmm. never walk in with the audacity to assume mm-hmm. that I am the best solution to my client. Right. I know that there are things that I bring to the table and then there are things that my competitors bring to the table as well. You know, we are living in a very different time and age. We are. We are not living in the age where we will get forward by saying, oh, our competitors, they don't have this. No, our competitors have a few things too. But sure. here is what we have. And more than what we have, we bring it with a certain authenticity and humanity and humility right. that I- will shift the scales in your order. Yeah, uh, in that, your, uh, on your side. And that's what I was going to ask you about. So one of the things that you can't do, right, is you can't be inauthentic. So what you need, what you were describing there, I mean, maybe there are some people who would be tempted to have, oh, well, let me get these couple of stories together that sound really good and I can I can trot them out at the right time. And But if you're... But you need to have some level of authenticity, right? You can't just make oh, up yes. a bunch of stories and go in and try and use this as a technique, right? Yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, my money back guarantee expires when you do that inauthentic storytelling. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a fact. You can't do that. Uh, and here's the thing. People have a very strong, what I call BS meter. And I think you know mm. what I'm talking about. Sure. You know, you, you can get the best story in the world, but if you're not owning that story, you're not believing in that story. Mm-hmm. It's not a story that you connect to. And not all stories can be told by everybody. And there's exactly. some stories that, that, that you will tell, which you will tell with such conviction and passion and authenticity that when I tell it, it'll be like, well, you know what? It's a good story, but there's something that's missing about it. The, the energetics of telling a story is so important. And I always tell my clients, Stand there and tell the story, in, you know, in an empty room to yourself. And how does that make you feel in your body? Right. 
if it's making you feel uncomfortable, because here's the thing, your brain may lie to you because it's an intellectual process, mm -hmm. but your body and your gut doesn't. Right, right. So if it's not sitting well with you, do not expect it to be sitting well with your clients. It is just not going to happen, right? And so I'm really glad you brought this up. We're not talking about inauthenticity. We're not talking of concocted stories. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is a real danger that we are at because I know that there's a whole bunch of, um, you know, uh, there's a community of people who believe as long as you have a checklist, it's like uh, strong opening, check. Uh, right. You know, dose of emotion, check. Um, uh, lesson, check. You know, plot twist, check. I'm like, and I tell people, I said, listen, if you're looking for the checklist, I'm not the person you want to work with. Right. You want to work with me when you want storytelling uh, a part of your DNA to get activated mm -hmm. so that you're an authentic, powerful storyteller that people can connect with. Otherwise, I mean, how many times have you gone to one of those slick Hollywood productions, which to the other question which you asked, right? How do we know when to stop telling yeah. a story? Mm -hmm. you, you watch you watch that Hollywood film and like, okay, that movie should have been over 45 minutes yeah, ago. Which, yeah, one exactly. I, which one did I see recently? That who was that? The the Avengers, right? Okay. Yes, I haven't had the pleasure yet, but my son <laughs> my son wants us to go and I believe it's like two and a two and a half hours long or something. Right. And so here's the thing. I I, you know, I, if, you, if people have seen the movie, I hope they agree with my, my analysis. And I, I would love for you to go see the movie and then drop me an email. I will. The last 30 minutes was somebody on the production team going around and saying, all right, have we had, hit all the diversity markers? Have we made sure there's a woman on the scene? Have we made sure, <laughs> sure that we have just put in enough to let them know there's another movie? It was painful. You ruined a perfectly good movie by trying to tick some boxes. And here's the thing. Mm -hmm. If Hollywood and Avengers can get it wrong, yeah. then you as a salesperson definitely need to be doing some work in understanding when is it a good point for you to pull the plug on a story mm -hmm. and say, this is it. Well, I, yeah, yeah I, I think that's a great point because I also believe that some of the best stor stories don't need to be long and winding either. You know, no. they, can be, they can be short and to the point. And, and I, think, I think that is a danger that some people can slide into, as you say, maybe bringing too much, uh, too much into the story, too many, too many plot twists that don't actually reinforce whatever point it is you're trying to make. So I, I definitely think, yeah, there's a danger if people aren't careful that they could over embellish a story or make it drag it out for too long, as opposed to having it make an, a, 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 a semi quick but powerful emotional connection if you like yeah absolutely and you know uh, it just reminded you know i'm a storyteller so so many <laughs> stories just come to me in, in the conversation but i remember once uh, uh you know george bernard shaw who's this in, uh, english playwright right? from irish was, was it, wasn't he from ireland right he was yeah. perfect um and, you know, he wrote, I think it was, he was supposed to write, a, uh, he entered a, a storytelling competition, but he was supposed to write a story, I think six or seven words. Mm -hmm. And the story, I think, if I remember it accurately, and I'm pretty sure I will not, said something like, uh, blue baby shoes never used for sale. Seven words. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure anybody who listens to that story will have, so many stories that they will spin around that one sure. sentence. Mm -hmm. And depending on the context in which that story is dropped, it could mean many different things to many people. Yes, exactly. So stories don't have to be long and winding. They can be very short and introduced at the right time. They can really shift. The other thing I want to be mentioned really quickly because I'm being mindful of time here is that the people make the mistake of thinking that the only stories they want to tell are actually success stories sure and, and i don't think that's the case at all no, i think I, I, a, lot of, a lot of the other ones are far more interesting and it's funny it's it's one of the things that when i ever interview somebody for a job i mean i ask about all the good things but i love to ask people to tell me a story about something that they were responsible for that absolutely crashed and burned and what they learned from it. And I really want somebody to be honest and tell me some rather than say, rather than give me the old, 
well, this, this didn't work out, but it turned out to be a positive. It's like, no, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the ones we crashed and burned. And what did you learn from it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, um, I think that, that clients value that so much more than mm-hmm. you're pretending that everything is together because it's not, again, it's just the age we are entering. It is yeah. the age of the human organization where we want to see people's humanity. And, you know, I, I have sat with sales teams where we have done, all right, you know, let's get all our failure stories together and let's, let's look at what did that allow us to become Mm-hmm. And how can we help the customer understand that we we are people who see that, you know, failures are a stepping stone to success? I mean, sure. let's face it, all this talk of we're in the age of disruption. Yes, we are in the age of disruption. But that also means that no matter what system you're selling, no matter what product is out there, it is going to get disrupted sooner or later. And what you do after that is the real question. So what are your stories of disruption that you manage to write up, Right. Help Mm -hmm. me see you as a human beyond the brand, beyond the product, beyond the sales process. So, you know, to to your audience, I would say, yeah, before and after stories are good. Um, Success stories are good. But, you know, stories of failure, stories of interpersonal connection, stories about who you are as an individual and what you bring to the table. All those stories. It's an ecosystem of stories that salespeople need to have rather than here are my three signature stories and I'm (laughs) off the market. Well, that's excellent. Well, that's a great way of summing up as we're bumping up against the end of our time here, uh, Tambi. So this has been fascinating. But before I go, I wanted you to give, uh, give you a chance to tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do and how they can learn more about you. Sure. Um, so uh, I do a lot of work in the area of leadership in the age of disruption, which is why you mm-hmm. keep kept seeing those threats coming in. Mm-hmm. And storytelling is my go-to tool. And I have been working a ton with chief marketing officers and their sales teams to help them understand how to take the conversation beyond the usual product tech spec that we tend to do where, you know, one, one person comes in and says, we have, you know, this thing in the cloud. And then the next one that comes and says, we have it in the cloud too. And it's it's kind of like a race to the bottom. We have it in a fluffier cloud than theirs. (laughs) That's right. Us are whiter than theirs are. And we will give you a half a cloud more than the other person did. Um, You know, big, big ticket sales in particular. um, And I work with looking at go-to-market strategies in an entire region. Mm -hmm. Spend a lot of time for the CEO trying and understand what's the pushback coming from the market. And what's the narrative? And we didn't talk about narrative at all. But narrative is that overarching story for your brand that you take to the market. You have to have clarity on that because all the small stories that your salespeople, your account managers are telling, it's like all roads lead to Rome. All stories must lead back to the narrative and the organization must speak in one voice. Mm -hmm. And the last piece that I I help them do is uh, show up in their own stories. And what I tell people is be present in your own presentation. Mm -hmm. If all you're doing is sitting there clicking slides, you know what, a chatbot is going to replace you pretty soon. (laughs) So how do you bring your personal journey and story and conviction to connect with what you're wanting others to be convinced about? So it starts all the way from the C-suite, goes to the account managers and the regional country heads and all of that. But it always involves a very interpersonal one-on-one. Who are you? What's your story? What is it bringing to what we are trying to do in the market here? Which I find is a uh, is a far more transformative approach to, mm-hmm. to storytelling than saying, okay, sure. here's a checklist. Do you, did you get emotion? Where's the plot? <laughs> yeah. That sounds like Hollywood again. Shimmy, give me more emotion. <laughs> yeah. So I think we did create um, uh, this website called nostorynosales.com where I think we put in some common mistakes that that people uh, make when they start storytelling. So I think that's one place they could check me out. Uh, but also I think LinkedIn is a great place. And if they say they are, you know, uh, friends of yours, um, you I will be sure to accept. Yeah, yeah, I was going <laughs> to say, if they say they're, they're friends of mine, you're going to hit decline immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now, listen, Tambi, this has been this has been fantastic. And maybe you'll come back and we'll talk about the overarching narrative in more detail, maybe in another day. Sure. Sounds good. Listen, thank you so much for having me over. I, I wish we had more time. I really enjoyed the conversation. Excellent. Well, we'll come back and do it again. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. See you all again for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.